a little bit better. And I will um, uh, talk a little bit about um, where demography fits into this uh, framing today. Um, so uh, we are using uh, population dynamics um, to assess the vulnerability of heat stress and um, we are uh, downscaling um, different uh, uh, data sets from the different SSPs um, at the very uh, high resolution, uh, me at the city level and my colleague Andrea, um, he will uh, show later how he does that at the uh, European level. Um, and uh, uh, the reason we are presenting together today is because we are uh, going to um, compare two different methods. Uh, I'm uh, using a Bayesian model averaging uh, methodology and Andrea is uh, using machine learning. Um, so uh, let's uh, get into it. Um, as I said earlier, I uh, study the climate risk on human health. Um, and um, very recently, the World Health Organization has uh, uh, stated that climate change is one of the biggest uh, threats to um, uh, humanity. Today, um, a very recent uh, research uh, paper um, from uh, Nature Climate Change found that around 37% of the global um, deaths related to warm season heat-related um, mortality can be attributed to anthropogenic uh, climate change. Um, and uh, to better understand uh, the climate risk uh, uh, coming from heat stress, I used the um, uh, IPCC risk framing, which is a, a function of the hazard, exposure, and uh, vulnerability to heat stress. Um, I don't know if you can see the figure, but this is the um, IPCC framing. So in this case, hazard would be heat stress. Exposure would be uh, the total um, population that is exposed to this heat stress, especially in cities where um, they are uh, more affected by the UHI or the urban heat island uh, effect. And then vulnerability. And is this component of the climate risk that I will focus on in my presentation. Um, and um, this is the link, um, essentially, with the, with the demographic um, uh, variables that I'm uh, using to quantify vulnerability. So, um, from um, epidemiological literature, we actually know that certain population groups are a lot more susceptible to heat stress than others. So, for example, older adults above the age of 65, um, even more so above the age of um, 85 and uh, so on. In some cases, um, women um, are more susceptible to heat than men. Um, and uh, those with low socioeconomic status um, uh, register higher mortality and morbidity. Uh, rates. Um, and because um, the socioeconomic status is uh, very strongly correlated with um, educational attainment, uh, we use education as a proxy uh, to uh, quantify uh, this in our model. Um, from the recent uh, IPCC uh, report, uh, Working Group 2 on Impacts and Adaptation, um, they really stress the importance of um, understanding the local knowledge uh, or uh, and getting information at the very local level. And from climate science, it's very common and we hear very often about downscaling methods of uh, climate data. And here we argue that it's very important to um, do the same for other um, socioeconomic variables. And uh, specifically, this downscaling of global information and not on only climate information is very relevant for um, uh, targeted adaptation measures and uh, local decision, um, informing local decision making. Um, so um, all the, uh, the data for uh, all the variables that I uh, uh, presented earlier, so age, sex, and education, are available from the shared socioeconomic pathways uh, that are hosted at um, uh, the Wittgenstein uh, Center. Um, but um, the data available is rather core, so you can find uh, this data either at the country level or uh, gridded um, uh, course uh, resolution data. So for the case study of Madrid, uh, here we can see that uh, uh, we have about uh, 20 to 25 uh, data points or cells um, in the city, which tells us very little about the internal heterogeneity and population dynamics within the city. 
So the objective of our study is to downscale um, the different um, data from the different uh, SSP demographic projections um, at much higher resolution. Uh, I am using uh, Bayesian model averaging um, as a method. And uh, I use data input from the city of Madrid at census tract level, so compared to the 20 to 25 uh, data points that are available under the SSPs, the raw data that we get from the city of Madrid is uh, 2,400 uh, data points um, at census tract level, so it's um, uh, polygons uh, throughout the um, uh, city, and we, we can really see the differences uh, between different regions of the city. And so the census track, uh, data is uh, available um, from 2012 and 2020. Um, and we have organized it in uh, three age groups. Uh, so the general population, uh, adult population, uh, for comparison between 25 and 64 years old, 65 uh, to 84 and 85 plus, because we know that this is um, a good, um, so the impacts, uh, within the older population groups are much higher than the younger, older adults. Uh, so we want to capture these um, differences. We also have uh, data sets for uh, both males and females and on different uh, educational attainment levels. So uh, ESED level, this is the international standard for um, education. Um, zero to two is uh, no education up to primary education. Then three to four is secondary education and five to eight is um, uh, tertiary education and so uh, for one um, we do this for all the uh, different categories of uh, age and sex so let's uh, say for example that we want to project uh, females with uh, no to primary education uh, between the age of uh, 65 to um, 84 so um, we add uh, we tap all the information about education in this age group of uh, females we tap that into the model together with mortality, fertility, and um, internal migration within the city of Madrid. And the model uh, uh, output is projections for the year of 2020, uh, based on the same structure um, for the same uh, age and sex category and education. And this we compare with the raw data that we got from uh, the city of Madrid. And we find, I, I don't have enough time to go into the details here, but we found that the, the projections are very much uh, in line with the, with the raw data. So the model performs quite well. And so once... Right. <laughs> so once this is established, we tap back the uh, data from the projections, we tap it back into the model to uh, create projections for 2030, 2040, and 2050. We do this for the middle of the road scenario, so based on the raw data. Um, and then we want to uh, compare that with the sustainable or an optimistic scenario, sustainable development, with the, and the pessimistic um, scenario, uh, the regional rivalry. Um, so uh, this is my uh, second to last slide. <laughs> um, so we, I just want to uh, say a few words about the model. Uh, so it's a, uh, we assume a linear model structure with uh, dependent variable Y that can be, uh, for example, females with no um, education up to primary education. And uh, that is dependent on uh, um, a matrix of independent variables. And one of the um, uh, very uh, important advantages of using uh, Bayesian approaches or this particular Bayesian approach is that this X matrix of independent variables can be very large. So we can use a lot of um, uh, different uh, types of data. And uh, this solves uh, an issue that we have in uh, projections of education that um, it's not very clear from the literature which variables should be used um, to, to determine uh, and to make uh, uh, educational projections. So this uh, solves us uh, that problem. And uh, it also... Oh, right. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, because um, uh, it does not uh, uh, require uh, too many, uh, too much um, uh, input data from uh, a period in time. So essentially, we could do the same projections only with data from uh, 2012, and then we use data from 2020 just to check the model uh, performance. 
Um, and because we can include so many uh, different variables and what the model does is essentially calculate all the possible combinations of these um, different variables and assign them a weight based on model fit, uh, we, if we can effectively incorporate uncertainty, um, which is, uh, um, uh, gives us a, a really uh, big advantage um, in these projections. Um, and then there are also some disadvantages, um, especially because of the high resolution uh, needs uh, for data input. Um, also, this, uh, uh, collecting this data might uh, in, uh, involve uh, delays in uh, reproduction of uh, such a study. And it also, it only uh, restricts the analysis to demographic variables, whereas uh, we know from different vulnerability uh, literature uh, that um, there are a lot of other factors such as the urban fabric um, and uh, share of green and blue spaces within the city, for example, that also contribute a lot to how vulnerable um, people are. So uh, thank you very much. I'll give the word to Andrea and uh, then we can take questions at the end. <laughs> It's a different presentation, but I can I can find it here. I'm conscious about the time. I have your older presentation. I mean, it's fine. I mean, I think we just need to hurry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can try to find it here. Yeah, this is your old. I need to be as fast as we can. But I think now you're Oops. not connected anymore. Yeah, I need to connect Oops. back. Yeah, we, we can just ask um, just to try to as uh, fast as possible. Okay, so I, I will just start from the small screen and. Ah, okay. Is this working like this? Okay. Okay, so. Um, Hello everyone, also from, from my side. Uh, I'm uh, Andrea Tamburini from the Wittgenstein Center and I will now follow up on the discourse that uh, Julia started. And I will uh, present you our alternative approach for the subnational population projections uh, where we increase the geographical scaling and we focus on the, on the European case. I mean, the main message of this slide is just like in Europe coexist very different climate and very different population structures. But if we develop a bit more on this, I mean, we know that like climate change has very different effects on uh, different regions, which are affected by different phenomena and with different uh, intensities. At the same time, in parallel, there is also uh, the demographic shift happening that happened already, in particular in the, in the European case which brought to a general aging of the population. This means that a few decades uh, down the road, we, uh, we, we, have, we, we might have, and we are having actually, an increasing amount of the population falling in this uh, category of the vulnerable uh, population, in particular to climatic events like, for example, the current heat wave. Um, this, uh, this means that, I mean, besides this, uh, we can in general say uh, that the, the, the health risk could be by different societal levels. We have an individual one, so with age, sex, as already mentioned, but also macro level, where the quality of the health system plays a big role, which is also uh, a matter of policies at the subnational level. So let's have a look at the motivation, objective, and strategy of our work. So the motivation is to improve our understanding of the implication of future population dynamics for climate vulnerability. Uh, what do we want to achieve in practice? So our objective is to disaggregate existing uh, national level SSPs at the NUTSCHU level, and I'm gonna tell you in a while what is meant with NUTSCHU, and preserving the information by age, sex, and educational attainment also in this case. And how do we want to achieve this? Uh, we want to, first of all, identify the special patterns of aging and educational attainment development using a machine learning approach. And then once these are identified, we want to use these to build the projection model based on that. 
Okay, the specific and necessary data inputs for our case are the population size at the NUTS2 level for 34 European countries. Uh, the NUTS system, which is the nomenclature of territorial units for statistics, is a hierarchical system uh, for naming uh, economic regions in the EU and in the UK. And this has the, uh, the scope of uh, collecting, developing, and harmonizing uh, statistics uh, for Europe at the regional level. And moreover, what is important is that the NUTS2 is the, let's say, the basic, um, most, uh, the basic uh, uh, dimension for the policies at the regional level. But, okay, for these data, these are available from 1999 until uh, 2020, both for male and females, seven age categories, and three education categories. And with this uh, plot, I just want to point out, this is the proportion of total population with high level of education in the age group 65-74 for 2015. And this is just to point out the level of heterogeneity we can see also in these kind of proportions not just at the national level, but also at the subnational level. So, uh, as I said, we are after the, uh, the dynamics between, behind aging and... Um, uh, I'm sorry, Adam. You, the, you, you two only have 12 minutes, but you already used like 15 minutes. Um, so can you just uh, quickly wrap up? Yeah, I will wrap up as fast as possible, sorry. Um, so we are after... The, uh, the spatial patterns for aging and education uh, distribution at the NUTS2 level. So our independent variable represents this changing proportionally at the subnational level over the one at the national level. Is explained or model at the moment with a machine learning approach which is based on the uh, regression tree approach from Strisnik and is explained by var independent variables. I won't go into details, but they are both like uh, geographical variables. So for example, level of urbanization, but also um, age specific uh, for the other age groups. So, so to also give this structure of like which age groups are gonna be developed in the next ones, also considering the education structure within them. Uh, I mean, for the projections part, I think that we can uh, go through it. I mean, it's just a machine learning approach, so we have a, a learning set and a test set. Let me come to the, the final slide. These are strongly SSP-based projections, um, not just for the data they use, because we include both the national level projections by level of education, but also the global one square, one square kilometers uh, uh, so downscale population grids from GAO which also opens an interesting question about the coherency of the different SSPs uh, versions, and, but also because of the iterative proportional fitting. I won't go into details, just very fast over the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I mean, maybe let's focus just on the disadvantages. We, and this is why it makes sense to compare these methods and possibly in the future try to combine them. The, we don't have an account for uncertainty. Uh, the model for how it built sticks to historical data and replicates them, and the fact that the geographical variables uh, are static. I'm sorry for going over the time. Thank you very much. Sorry. So, don't be running late. Um, if you have some burning questions, please ask. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. So how are you kind of dealing with that or suggesting people who use that data to deal with this um, in their analysis? I mean, uh, as I said, it's, uh, this one is, I mean, it doesn't have a Bayesian structure behind it, so we don't have a, a direct uh, accounting for uncertainty in the modeling part. This is, um, this is somehow taken into consideration when, uh, but I think this is a bit of a general point, when we consider SSP-based, so scenario-based projections. So we, we are not gonna, like, also the discourse that was, uh, went, we went through before, I mean, we are not gonna somehow give, as the UN, like one trajectory with some uncertainty around it, but we rather give different possibilities according to different scenarios, which come from 
and I mean, just to, uh, let's say, yeah, as you said correctly, we don't have like a direct uncertainty accounting, but we, uh, we rely on the already existing SSPs projections in, bo in both senses. So at the national level, we account for the total population counts by education, and we fit our results to that, but also at the subnational level, we take the grids, we group them, at the subnational level we compare, and so we somehow are, we rely on the total population counts. Okay, thank you, thank you both. And we, uh, I'm conscious of all the time, and if uh, the presentation we have a brief presentation left, and you can save some time or be on time, that would be a um, big help. And uh, we'll move to our third presentation panel, and the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, maybe I can, I can start with the introduction. Um, thanks very much for having me here today. My name is Lena Reimann. Uh, this is not my, uh, let's see, but yeah. Um, I am a postdoc at the Institute for Environmental Studies at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam. And um, today I'm presenting work that I did during my PhD, um, where we produced uh, spatial population projections based on the SSPs. Um, for the Mediterranean region and um, what I did or what we did in, in that work was to account for um, different internal migration um, processes and also for spatial development patterns in these projections. And yes, perfect, okay. Yeah, so the reason why we started this work or the starting point was that continental to global scale coastal flood risk assessments usually account for the uncertainties, um, the future uncertainties related to sea level rise um, by using different sea level rise projections based, usually based on the RCPs. So that's what you can see on the left hand side. Uh, and they've also uh, recently started to account for uncertainties related to um, spatial population, but usually these assessments do not account for um, internal migration processes. So rural urban migration and also inland coastal migration is rarely assessed, and um, they do not account for spatial development patterns. And by that, I mainly refer to urban sprawl. And um, as you can imagine, if you do not account for these processes, you potentially over or underestimate future coastal flood risk. Um, so in order to address um, this issue, we used uh, the Mediterranean region as a case study region and uh, due to two main re uh, reasons. The first one is that um, there are high population densities and urbanization levels in the direct coastal zone, which makes it, very, um, yeah, uh, which increases, I guess, the risk uh, from sea level rise related um, impacts. And then the second one also, there are large differences in socioeconomic development across um, the northern, southern and eastern parts of the region. So the approach uh, that I've used, and I think many of you are familiar with it already, is um, the gravity-based modeling approach that was mainly developed by Brian Jones and Brian O'Neill uh, in the last roughly 10 years. Um, so the gravity-based approach um, the, ah, now I, okay, perfect. Uh, the gravity-based approach assumes that um, areas that are densely populated are more attractive for human settlement than areas that are less densely populated, and it also assumes that this attractiveness decreases with increasing distance from those places. And um, this is what you can see here in this, in this figure on the, on the upper part of the figure. Um, the model uses a distance decay function and by, with which we can then determine the attractiveness of any given place in space. And um, this is um, yeah, applied to uh, the, um, the population distribution in basically the first time step. And then a population potential surface is calculated based on that, that's the second uh, grayish map that you can see there. And based on that, uh, then the population for the next time step is uh, distributed. And this is also done by including a spatial mask that masks out all land that's not available for human settlement. 
and the model differentiates um, urban and rural locations and it was initially developed at the global scale with a resolution of 14 kilometers. And um, so I used this model and um, which was called include and um, extended it to become conclude, which is coastal include to also be able to account for in, um, inland coastal migration. And I downscaled the model to a resolution of 30 arc seconds. And um, also I differentiated two geographical regions. So again, the north versus the south and east of the Mediterranean. And I used specific model assumptions for these two geographical regions. The assumptions that we developed uh, that went into the model are based on the Mediterranean coastal SSPs, which we developed and published in 2018. And these are based on the coastal SSPs, which were developed by a colleague of mine um, for the entire globe, and also on the global SSPs by Brian O'Neill et al. And the Mediterranean coastal SSPs include region-specific uh, drivers of socioeconomic development and also distinct assumptions uh, for the two geographical regions that I mentioned. And we mainly base our assumptions that we use for the model um, on the narratives that were produced as part of the um, Mediterranean coastal SSPs. So we first, in the first step, we calibrated the model to um, capture spatial uh, development patterns. And these are represented in the model by a spatial development parameter. So based on historical population uh, or observed population data, we um, derive these parameters and then we use the parameters um, and modified them based on the different SSP. So based on what kind of um, urban sprawl assumptions are in the narratives, we, we um, yeah, uh, modified these parameters. So here you see the model, uh, the sprawl assumptions that we included in the model just for three SSPs. We did this for all five SSPs, but just to make this a bit more um, yeah, manageable, I'm, I'm just presenting those three. So under SSP1, which we call Green Coast, we assume that sprawl decreases relative to historically observed sprawl, uh, especially in the northern parts of the region, but also in the south and east. Under SSP3, troubled waters, we assume that um, sprawl increases a bit, and this is mainly because it's not a well-managed scenario, so there's hardly any management of sprawl. And under SSP5, coast rush, we assume high sprawl, both in uh, the north and in the south and east, and this is because it's a, um, yeah, it's a very rich uh, scenario with uh, the assumption that there's lots of urban sprawl. Uh, this uh, now to come to the to the population projections that we produce. This is the population distribution of today, so the year 2010, and you can see that there's already, yeah, as I mentioned also earlier, there's high population densities in the coastal zone, um, and this is, by the way, based on GHS pop. Uh, so you see that there's quite some concentration, so there's a lot of discussion also about the data sets that go into these projections, but I will come to those a bit later. Oh, okay. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, SSP1 in 2100. Uh, we see, in general, um, population decline and uh, a high concentration of population in um, the coastal zone. SSP3, we see um, rapid urban sprawl in the south and the east, and this is mainly driven by rapid population growth in these uh, countries. And in the northern part of uh, the region, um, there's population decline. And SSP5, you see basically the exact opposite. We have a decline in population in the south and east and rapid sprawl and also rapid population growth in the northern parts of the region. And when we look at the number of people living in the coastal zone, which is um, which we define as the low elevation coastal zone that covers all land with an elevation of up to 10 meters and hydrological connection to the sea, you can see compared to the baseline, which is the dashed line here, um, that we have an increase in coastal population under all scenarios until 2100. And um, the number of people living in the low elevation coastal zone is mainly or is dominated um, by people living in the south and east of the region and not so much um, by people living in the north and you see this really high increase under SSP3. Um, 
And what we can also say is that coastal migration seems to have a bigger in, uh, impact or effect on um, the future numbers or spatial patterns of population than urban sprawl, because also under the urban sprawl um, um, assumptions or, or scenario SSPs, which is SSP5 specifically, or especially we see uh, an increase in coastal population compared to the baseline, although we also have, uh, yeah, uh, um, population decline uh, in the south and east. Okay, uh, let me quickly uh, com compare. So this is, uh, yeah, reflect on the different approaches that are available. So we have two static approaches which do not account for urban sprawl patterns, which is Merkens et al. 2016 and the paper that we did in 2018, and then two approaches that use a gravity-based approach. Um, so those account for urban sprawl as well. And this study, which is the pink um, bar, you see we accounted for both uh, coastal migration and urban sprawl and uh, what you can see actually is that our projections produce pretty high coastal population numbers and this is again because we assume that coasts remain attractive uh, in the course of the century and for example Merkens et al and also um, our uh, 2018 paper there we assumed for example under SSP1 that there is a decline in um, or a stagnation in people moving to the coast and that's why the numbers there for example are much lower. Mm. This is almost the last slide, uh, which, um, and I want to basically stress with this slide that um, it does not only depend on the modeling approach that is used for producing these projections, but it also depends a lot on the data that go into these projections. So all of the four studies that I just, uh, where I just showed you the results, they use four different population data sets as input into their modeling approaches. And um, I have not systematically analyzed this, but I would assume that the effect of the different uh, data sets that I use as the basis for these projections is larger than the effect of the different modeling approaches that I used for this. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, the, the pictures you, or the maps, you, you can see for yourself that there are huge differences, um, yeah, uh, which are mainly driven by the input data. So let me quickly wrap up. Um, we produced a high-resolution gravity-based model that accounts for urban rural, um, inland coastal migration, as well as for urban sprawl. And it produces distinct spatial population patterns across the SSPs and the two geographical regions of the Mediterranean. And the model, um, because of its modest data requirements, um, and uh, all of the data sets that we used were global-scale data sets. It can actually be um, upscaled to the globe quite easily. Um, the paper of this has been published uh, in Environmental Research Letters last year, so feel free to have a closer look at that. And um, let me maybe just end with that, but yeah, this is what I wanted to uh, also mention very briefly, is that I will present an extension of this model to account for sea level rise related migration in session 31 tomorrow, so please stop by in that session as well. Thank you. Great. Uh, yeah, this is great. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is related to what you're going to say tomorrow. Um, I, I was trying to wrap my mind around what's the link between what you showed and the spatial mask that says oh, you cannot go in different places. Does that spatial mask include uh, changes in habitability of the coast due to sea level rise or whatnot? Um, I assume you're going to talk about that tomorrow, I guess. Um, and because you should result for 2100, and since we're going to see impacts of sea level rise before that, we might have a whole population and economic dynamic that might shift actually those projections, and you would have pretty different results by 2100 than you would have here. So I, I guess what would be the use of the results of 2100 here if you don't have the sea level rise stuff in it is my point. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it's a bit so. There's a bit of an echo, and I I had trouble understanding your point. So you spoke about the spatial mask. I heard that, and also about changes. Um, and I guess it was about the sea level rise related, um, but I didn't fully get it. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the what of around uh, the yeah yeah so I mean yeah yeah so that's basically exactly why we why we did this so that was also the idea behind this was uh, to yeah look at how these uh, spatial patterns then differ when we account for sea level rise because um, as I think many of us know the SSPs they do not account for any climate change uh, change signals so that was the first step to see what it looks like without climate change and then add uh, sea level rise on top and uh, that's exactly how I did it basically I I then compared uh, the spatial distributions of no sea level rise versus sea level rise. And um, yeah, I will talk about that a bit more tomorrow, yeah. The fourth one. Yeah. Lei Wen Jiang. Okay, you keep the time. Um, I'll about to start. Um, what we try to do is uh, after the global aggregate uh, uh, SSP population projection, urbanization projection. Um, so there is the extension of SSPs uh, to um, local to. Um, geographical uh, scales at the mutual levels. And uh, uh, so we developed this model system to understand uh, um, how SSPs can, uh, um, uh, can be applied uh, um, and what kind of demography projections uh, can, can be done um, for um, different geographic scale and uh, administrative levels consistent uh, with uh, global SSPs, how, how we develop that. Um, I don't need to go this up. Um, so the objective is to enhance the scenario framework by projecting demographic changes and produce spatial population projections consistent with SSPs at all geographic and administrative scales um, using the examples from the United States, Mexico, and, and Pakistan. And to demonstrate uh, um, the model system, we uh, developed uh, starting from NCAR and now at the Population Council called uh, the Community Demography Model. And so you can visit um, the, the website. It's uh, under the Population Environment Risk and Climate Change Program of the Population Council. It has four models. A urbanization projection model is a very simple uh, machine learning um, uh, method. And uh, a multi-regional population projection model is a multi-regional, uh, multi-dimensional model. And a household projection model project uh, the change in household composition size. And then a downscaling, spatial population downscaling model, um, the one like uh, Nena already um, introduced. Uh, a gravity model, and Brian Jones started to develop at uh, um, NCAR, then uh, now we carry on uh, at a um, publishing council. And I don't need to go to the detail of the mod models. And one thing I want to point out is that the multi-regional model, and then I ask the question, how um, migration um, across uh, different majority of uh, units are, are linked. And so this is the way, and we consider the bilateral migration um, across all um, uh, units of uh, the syst uh, population system. Say for the United States, you have 50 um, states. All the um, states are linked through the bil uh, bilateral migration flows. Um, so to make uh, population projections um, for the United States and there is a downscaling, right? Um, Brian Jones data, a global, uh, based, based on the 
global um, population projection for the U.S. don't scale directly to, to grid cells. And assuming that there is no the big changes, uh, no big variations across um, the states. But in fact, in the U.S., a more a, a very developed country, uh, country, and while most of the states has already below replacement level fertility, but some of the states has still has um, quite high um, uh, fertility. Mortality also differ quite a lot, and the migration, internal migration, uh, uh, vary quite a lot. And some states um, receive a lot of uh, again population from internal migration, and others uh, lost a lot of population uh, from. Um, internal migration. And not only the number, but also the age pattern. Say, for instance, uh, the migrants are moving from New York to Florida and are much older than the one like back from uh, Florida to, to New York. Um, so that's are the things like uh, yeah, very important, right? That will change the population distributions uh, um, by size, but also by age composition. So those are the things like uh, the model has the capacity and to yeah, count for. So then I just simply show the results, right? If we consider the regional variation and also internal migration, and the under SSP2, then you see um, the large differences across um, the states in population changes over the period of uh, um, 2010 to 2100, uh, versus the one if uh, it's a, a Global uh, downscaling, you know, national population projection um, um, on the on the on the on the right on the left. <laughs> so assume no changes, right? No no differences um, in um, across states. But we know that yeah, that's not a, um, yeah, something like a um, um, real. So there will be substantial differences in um, population across uh, states, changes in across states. So the model, um, this is uh, the, the, the changes uh, are from 2010 to uh, 2100. And then you downscale the results, right, um, to the grid cells. And this shows uh, um, the downscale results for New York City. And then you was on the, on the, um, on the left side, uh, that side, uh, <laughs> um, that's a, a downscaling, the, the, the new uh, consider uh, state uh, differences, right? So, and yeah, population um, in, in New York is, New York City will be much um, less um, than the one that is downscaled directly from national projection because uh, um, New York City is a large um, loser in internal migration. And compared to Colorado, Colorado gained a lot of population from internal migration. So the downscaling um, from the state level that you can see uh, um, some substantial increase in the population. This is also under SSP2. And consider that the US is a country um, Increase of the population and population growth, of forty percent of the population growth, uh, is through international migration, and the international migrants mostly come from uh, Mexico, and not from the Mexico um, evenly from from different uh, state, uh, all the states. They mostly come from the center and the west, and and those kind of uh, migrants. Uh, their age gender uh, profiles also have very important impacts not only on the population growth in the US but also in Mexico. So we also look at uh, uh, the population changes, uh, consider international migration, internal migration, all um, variations uh, in um, the Mexico. And so compared to uh, what we assumed in the um, global SSP scenario, um, SSPs assume uh, the international migrants, uh, um, uh, Mexico lose a lot of population through uh, in international um, uh, migration. Um, the black line shows the, 
uh, reality compared to the scenario. You, you see that over the past uh, recent years, uh, um, the international migration um, to, from, from uh, Mexico uh, substantially declined. And even uh, the, the international migration, if, uh, the, the, the flow is even lower than SP3, right? That's a new reality. That's a new update of the data. And so we need to uh, consider. And so we make an assumption um, for the, um, the new kind of uh, SSP, right, for uh, um, Mexico international migration. Uh, okay, enough. <laughs> um, and also this, um, the left expectancy. And the reality is the black one. So you see that in the recent years, the life expectancy, the mortality increase uh, quite a lot for Mexico. And because of uh, the homicide, the cartel drug, um, um, the war, and the there is a decline in, in life expectancy, lower than SP3, right? So that's a new reality, and we need to also uh, take into account consideration um, in our uh, research. And we also look at the, the changes uh, in, across all the states we find that in recent years, right, and although there is a, some variations across all the states, but they all converge. And yeah, that's a kind of a um, yeah, look at the historic pattern and we see how, what kind of assumption we can make uh, for all the states. And it, a convergency uh, just told us that, yeah, probably we, we can make uh, uh, that kind of uh, assumption. And also internal migration. Internal migration, again, um, the internal migration rates declined for um, Mexico, uh, like uh, in many other countries in recent years, um, it, it, which is about the same as SP3 um, uh, assumptions. So we can make uh, uh, some uh, uh, assumptions for other SPs. And uh, yeah, so this is the projected results, and you sh it shows uh, because of uh, the variations, the spatial variations, um, and shows that uh, the population growth will only happen um, in the north and, uh, the, and in the south. And the center, east, and, and the west all lose population under all the SPs at a different ex extents, right? And uh, that all we also can uh, use the model, can look at uh, what the driving forces, what are the driving forces of uh, population changes, whether it's due to international migration or it's due to um, natural growth, uh, you know, birth, marriage, uh, death, right? Or whether it's due to internal migration. So yeah, we can uh, find out that it, the driving forces of population um, growth for different states uh, go quite different. Um, so we also make a, a um, use of the urbanization model to make projections for um, this Subnational level, the um, administrative units, and uh, this uh, application in Pakistan, we find that it's, um, Pakistan has a very different uh, um, urbanization um, regional variation. And we uh, use uh, um, the model and to make projection and validate their results using the historic um, uh, records. And for the time's sake, you know, I, I stop here and uh, um, and if you have any questions, um, I'm very happy to discuss. Thank you. Last time it was very difficult. It should be. Let's try. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah, I can. Hear okay, cool. No, no echo? Good. Uh, I'm Rijke Kuiper from Wageningen Economic Research. I have a question. I'm totally not a demographer. I'm an economist. And I'm especially wondering about domestic migration. There's, say, less limits on that normally uh, than international migration. How much can you account for, say, change in economic structure and employment? Because that will affect certain groups of the population differently. Uh, certain uh, exposure to heat stress will be different for different occupations. It will affect, yeah, how things are moving. Can you capture that in any way? Yeah, that's um, we hope we can, and so that's that's why you know that um, um, we want to engage you um, 
with stakeholders or other experts to understand uh, the, uh, the international migration patterns uh, across all um, yeah, the possibilities with uh, um, the link with uh, different SSPs. And uh, uh, for the United States, for instance, uh, because of the political um, administration, right, um, and, uh, and Trump, um, interna international migration is all stopped, basically. Um, uh, international migration. Oh, okay, internal migration. Oh, internal migration, that's, yeah, definitely. In the U.S., uh, we, we are trying to understand uh, the, uh, the housing market or a uh, job market, right? How, how this uh, affect migration and the climate change. And we also um, working on that and see what kind of uh, um, weather may attract uh, migrants uh, than others. And so, the, the model system can, can help uh, to understand that. Um, we, in our um, U.S. population projection, we do consider that. And if you're interested in and probably I can send you our paper. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I think I'll follow up a little bit on this question here. I think it's really interesting also when you have a look at different uh, SSPs. I mean, you, you think in decades. So I'd be really interested in learning a bit more about the indicators that you use and what kind of projections you use for the future. What, what is the, the, the basis, the data that you actually use for that? Um, the data um, mostly is a, is a conventional demography data, right? From the census, um, from the national survey, and some of the Data then, uh, you know, is, is, for instance, the migration, we use uh, um, big data and collect uh, um, the migration flows. Projections for the future? For the future, that's uh, based on scenario. And so we make uh, assumptions of uh, future changes, uh, just as I showed, right? Look at the historical trends uh, in uh, migration. And yeah, I'll say under SP1, SP5, uh, we assume that. Uh, um, the future internal migration will go up to um, the 19, say, 1980s um, in the U.S. and in Mexico. And under SP3, uh, the um, internal migration will uh, stay as low as today or will continue the trends, uh, historical trends. Look at the historical trends and look at uh, the variations over time and assume uh, uh, the future trends. Yeah, that's what we do. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, want to... <laughs> yeah, just, want to, just want to briefly say that um, I had also did, did this for India and all these different SSPs and all these things, have, but I couldn't show it. But uh, also for India, this, all these things have to be considered, like just applying the SSPs national narrative to the sub-national, the same narrative would be result in, would not be fine. So even in the one SSP, when it says the fertility will be low for India, but in, when you go into the subnational level, for some states, it cannot go lower than a certain value, right? So, so we have to assume different variants within, uh, within the country. And this was a big challenge for us to find out how different they would be than what is at the national level. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, maybe I continue uh, the, <laughs> the last presenter, yeah? Camille, please. Uh, we are uh, uh, a bit at, at eight minutes past uh, our time, but uh, yeah, you have 12 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nice. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Camille Benma. I'm a doctor researcher uh, at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And um, yeah, here. And uh, last year I came here for YSSP to conduct, to start this research uh, on trying to integrate um, energy access as a determinant uh, of population protection. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm happy to be back in Yasa. Uh, let's see. I change like this, yes. So um, energy provides services that are essential for um, human development and well-being. Uh, but today there is about uh, a third of the population that doesn't have access to clean cooking energy and about 860 million people that don't have access to electricity. 
Uh, and in the context of the climate crisis, it's important to understand how much energy and carbon is needed to fill this gap and to uh, end energy poverty. Um, and there is recent research that uh, has shown that actually energy access uh, in low-income countries would have an effect on fertility. Um, why um, would that be? So first of all, uh, when you don't have access to modern energy and you have to rely on traditional wood, it's a huge burden and generally it falls on women and children, so to, to carry, so it takes a lot of time on household cores and when you switch to modern energy, that um, uh, lowers this burden. Uh, energy access also enables access to education, employment, reduced needs for child labor, uh, improved health and information, and all those factors are known to lead to fertility decline. Um, so the first project of my PhD was to um, build evidence for this relationship. So also with Roman, who's here today, we worked on that and we found uh, that after you control for the other known determinant of fertility, like education, uh, expanded access to electricity contributed to about a third of the fertility decline uh, between 1990 and 2015 in 44 high to medium <laughs> fertility countries. So this is a substantial uh, effect. And now um, I wanted to take that into account into a population projection. And the research question was how much energy is needed to reach universal access to modern energy while taking into account this feedback between uh, energy access and population dynamics. So how did we do that? Um, we built a two-step uh, modeling framework. The first step was to build a micro-simulation model of population projection, and the second step was to um, build the energy demand module. I'm gonna uh, walk you through the, this, uh, this uh, framework. We, the first uh, version, well, now we, we did this case study on Zambia, that is a high fertility country in southern Africa, with also um, low levels of energy access, in particular in rural areas. So the first step, as I said, is a micro-simulation model of population projection. Um, so it's a type of projection that uh, starts with the base population of individuals and um, that takes this population into the future according to transition probabilities. These transition probabilities, so for example, probability of giving birth, would um, here in this model depend on the energy access of uh, the woman, her level of education, whether she lives in rural urban areas, um, and her age, of course. And uh, we built uh, three scenarios based on the SSP framework. The first, uh, so each of these scenarios have um, different uh, education, mortality, urbanization, and electricity access and modern, um, access to modern cooking fuels. Uh, most of them are based from research coming uh, from YASA. Um, yeah, actually all of them. Um, so I have SSP1, which is a reali um, optimistic, re represent an optimistic future. SSP2 is a baseline. And on top of that, uh, we created a universal access to energy by 2040. The, so that's a very optimistic um, trajectory in terms of energy access. And it has the similar education project, um, uh, projection as in SSP1. So it's everything goes well, education and energy access. So um, we fit that into the model until 2017, and we obtain uh, an inter intermediary output, which has population projection by energy access groups, uh, education group, and rural urban area. And with this intermediary output, we uh, create, um, we uh, feed it into uh, energy footprint by uh, these same groups that we derived from a study uh, from the University of Leeds that also focused on Zambia. And from here, we can have the energy footprint uh, from, uh, uh, yeah, from these uh, different uh, categories. So here you have a a graph with rural energy footprint, but rural, urban, and um, uh, energy access groups and education groups on the x-axis. And finally, we obtain uh, for each time step 
the accumulated energy demands and the carbon emission um, of uh, Zambia's population. So what we found, the first uh, aspect that we look at is population. Um, although it's not really the, uh, the main output, but it's constituent of the energy uh, part. So here you can see the population trajectories uh, over time. And I compared, uh, so and the colors are the different uh, scenarios I uh, explained. And the dotted line on top is the um, SSP2 population projection from YASA. And the uh, plain line in the bottom is SSP1 from YASA. Um, and what I, we found is that the population in the universal access to energy scenario is about 10% uh, lower um, in 2050 uh, compared to SSP1. And if you go to SS, uh, 2070, it's about 14% lower. Um, now we, this population projection allows us to uh, derive the energy demands. So first of all, we can look at different um, fuels. Um, here you have the energy demand of the population over time and um, the facets on the x-axis represents the uh, three main type of fuels uh, and uh, the facets on, on the y-axis are the rural and urban area. Uh, so the, we have in the universal access to energy scenario important uh, firewood consumption reduction. Um, uh, we have increase in electricity access. And uh, interestingly, we also have uh, increase in, in charcoal uh, consumption in all these, um, uh, this scenario. But uh, let me show you actually, when you gather all those fuels and look at the total energy demand, what happens. Uh, on the right, you have the urban areas, and on the left, the rural area. And uh, you can see that actually in the universal, so when everyone gets access to energy, you have lower um, you get uh, lower uh, energy demand than in the SSP1 and SSP2. Um, so people are better off and consumption is lower. Um, it's uh, about 25% lower than in SSP1 in 2015 and 52% lower than in SSP2. And what is important and what I want to um, uh, say today uh, in the session is that the feedback on demography uh, contributed to reducing this demand um, by about 8% in SSP1 and 40% in SSP2. Um, and we are here. So what does that mean in terms of, um, uh, in terms of projection and uh, population scenario? So when you want to uh, project uh, um, how much energy is needed to end energy poverty, you need to use one population scenario. And usually, uh, because you don't necessarily look at these scenarios, four minutes, yeah, that's fine, three. Um, you would use a baseline, so you could use the SSP2 scenario or the UN medium variant. Uh, but here, our results suggest that using the SSP2 scenario would lead to a substantial overestimation of energy demand and CO2 that is needed to energy poverty. And of course, that has important policy implications. Um, so it's important to, when you want to assess this, to, to use population scenarios that are coherent with the uh, energy trajectory you're assuming. Uh, and last thing, so this was more on the methodological aspect, on the more practical aspect. The results also suggest that universal access to modern energy has important climate co-benefits and that the demographic feedback plays an important role here. Uh, so this should be an additional reason to drastically increase um, and accelerate investments in energy access. And finally, since energy is also very important for climate adaptation, um, we could also see the finance of energy poverty has a uh, contribution to climate justice. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks. Let me know if there is eco. Uh, this was super interesting. Thank you. I was just wondering, um, can you do, do you take into account the fact that people, once they do the fertility transition due to energy access, do they change their level of uh, energy consumption? And would you do you have like estimations of how much that accounts, like that reduces this uh, benefit for from a energy consumption yeah. perspective? Um, so actually, the um, we um, we calculate energy footprint uh, by uh, energy access group and education group. So as you move along the socioeconomic uh, status, you get access to energy, you increase education, you you have different consumption, um, and um, uh, for example, so there is many facets here, but uh, if you would take uh, going from uh, low education in rural area um, with access to electricity and without clean cooking fuel, which is the uh, second, um, uh, yeah, it's like the second in the bottom and the first, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and the matrix calculation doesn't work here. Anyway, um, you would get like much higher consumption of firewood in low education and um, much higher consumption in charcoal and small increase in electricity. And so that is taken into account in, in the model. And so what we find is that uh, even though this pattern changes, the, um, um, the, there will still be a, um, a reduction in energy demand compared to a, a scenario or a baseline scenario. Yeah. I have actually a question related to whether you include uh, feedbacks on mortality, because we know that more access to cleaner energy can also lower child mortality due to less in yeah. ambient uh, pollution, indoor pollution. Uh, do you account for this in your scenarios? Because I'm wondering whether then, if you don't account for also mortality feedbacks, whether you don't have to optimistic po uh, population decline in your projection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that's like an important uh, uh, limitation of the work is that uh, the, the um, uh, we don't have like internal mortality feedback. Um, of course, since it's a micro simulation model that could also be included. Um, for now, I think that wouldn't really uh, change drastically the results because in the universal access to modern energy, you uh, still have the assumption for mortality from SSP1, um, which are uh, optimistic. So mortality would also uh, go down. And so I think um, that wouldn't uh, change drastically the, the results if you would uh, also uh, include that. Yeah. Thanks, Camille. Uh, super interesting. I was wondering how much of the um, uh, scenario with universal access of energy depends on, uh, so the energy consumption level, uh, the, the decrease, how much it depends on the context of the country. So if you were to scale this up mm -hmm. to um, a regional level, uh, say, or a global level, will you still have to take into account the context in the different countries? Or can you do, for example, a gridded yeah. Uh, upscaling or downscaling. Um, so now we, we we use projection for sub-Saharan Africa of energy access, and we adapt it to the level of uh, the initial level of the country. Um, so if you, yeah, I mean I think you need to work with like projection for for regions that uh, are realistic for the whole um, for this for a similar context. Um, and if you use baseline uh, level, you can you can do this uh, this projection. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Cheers. Um, so it's not a direct question to you, it's just to like everyone in the room. Um, so I'm Lawrence Hawker from the University of Bristol. And I'm just wondering um, what resolution is high enough um, when we're doing these um, projection like downscaling. Um, I think 
most of the uh, focus in this meeting has been on extreme heat and the kilometre resolution is fine. But for other hazards such as flooding or landslides, you know, the spatial uh, footprint of these, these hazards are a lot smaller. And if you use a kilometre resolution, that heavily biases the exposure. So, um, yeah, I, I produced 90 metre um, downscale population for the flooding um, work but I'm just kind of wondering where we should go as a community whether we should do more one kilometers and having lots of sub-national and lots of different variations or whether to have fewer at a um, finer resolution so yeah it's kind of a, a good thing to think about over lunch I think um, cheers And right now, the, the downscaling model, the global downscaling model is at a, um, eighth degree. So that's a, about like a 12 kilometer. And so the, 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 the final resolution is already down to one kilometer. And for heat wave, uh, um, the purpose of a heat wave of uh, flaws, I think that uh, usually will be fine. But for sea level rise and the things like, uh, and the work like we, we are doing for, for the New York City, and they're talking about uh, um, final resolution at three meters. And they use that uh, kind of information on, for um, city planning. Say, for instance, the place I uh, lived in uh, Battery Park, they're trying to remove uh, the, water, uh, the, the current uh, uh, landscape and replace by a, a kind of a, a environmental friendly um, um, version. So that's something like, a, um, depends on, on what kind of a purpose, uh, what a research question you want to ask, right? What kind of a, um, policy um, action you want to take and for different purposes. So you want to engage uh, the uh, stock, uh, stakeholders uh, at different administrative level and different sectoral um, policy uh, makers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so uh, we uh, thank you for staying with us. I'm uh, almost uh, 